disappointed that uh, we didn't play as well as we should have played and could have played. Uh, we did not play well enough on offense or defense to be throughout the game to sustain and, and win the game. We had plenty of opportunities on both sides to make plays, do things, and we did not play. Now, Ole Miss did a great job. They played well, give them credit. But we had a lot of self-inflicted wounds and just how we fit things, did things, ran things, blocked things that we just, you know, people just, different guys took turns at times, and it was not a consistent of any one person. And that we have to learn to play better in big moments, big situations. And, you know, shot ourselves in the foot early in the game, uh, giving up way too many yards, too many drives, too many situations, field positions. We had them back. Those three drives starting inside the 10-yard line. We never got the ball back. They scored on two or three of them, and they never got the ball back. We even on offense where you could do some great things with it offensively, move the ball, but then we'd shoot ourselves in the foot with a little penalty or a missed block, drop ball, miss – I mean, just little thing, and everybody took a turn, and all of a sudden it's not there. But then after doing all that, finding ways to hang in there and put yourself back in position to win the game, which I commend our kids for. I mean, the ability to keep fighting in the game, to keep making changes in the game, to keep being coached in the game, and put ourselves in a position to win the game. And then on offense and defense, did not make some plays right at that time, which was disappointing, that could have put us over the hump. That could have got us back in the lead instead of 15-13 and then got stops. We, like I say, we had a chance down there inside the 10, and we dropped the ball for a touchdown. We uh, had missed a block down there, then we dropped another ball, and then kicked a field goal, and then we have a third and 11. Got them right back again. Could be another three and out. Go and get great field position. Give up a third and 11, and they get a drive. Go all the way back, and then unfortunately we have the turnovers and what we did. But we had opportunities to get ourselves back, and that was the encouraging thing to put ourselves back there. But then it was disappointing that we didn't keep the poise and execution in those critical moments. And it wasn't from want to. It's got to make sure we understand how to do it, stay relaxed, and, and get them to understand to do that and play better. And Ole Miss played a good game. Give them credit for things they did. We had our opportunities, but we didn't play well enough in that game. And it's disappointing because we had started fast in all the other four games we'd recently played. Got off to good starts, got off to good things, did well, and, you know, didn't do it in this game. Some unforeseen reason, we'll get to the bottom of it and figure it out. And it's not because they didn't want to or anything else. They had good preparation, had good practices. So we got to learn to take it on the field. And that's part of learning to climb the final part of that mountain, to go in that elite status and, and really understand how to win and play when you have to and when you want to, when you're expected to. And we'll learn to do that and we'll keep playing. We've got two more games left. We'll play really well, practice really well, and try to finish this season out the right way. These seniors commend them the last weekend this. Uh, Weekend, all the fifth-year seniors and seniors, they're going out. They've done a great job of rebuilding this program, putting the culture of it right back where we need to be, helping the recruiting basis of everything we do, finish this whole season out, and hopefully go on the road and play a really good game against a good LSU team, very talented LSU team down there on the road. And we'll see from there. All right, questions? Start with David Nuno on the right. Coach, with Prairie View coming up this week, uh, a couple of players earlier talked about their opponent is faceless. How does that help you in coaching week to week? Because it's, that means it's not about them. It's about preparation for your opponent, but it's about your own standard of excellence. And that's what we're talking about here. Our, you, you respect your opponents, you prepare for your opponents, but you play to your standards. You play to your level of how you got to play, which is something we had really done for four straight weeks. And we just didn't do this week. And they understand that, and they understand that we let that get away a little bit. And because my point is, whether you're playing the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Green Bay Packers, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, uh, Prairie View, Sanford, whoever it is, you practice the same, you play the same, you do the same. And, it, and people say, well, that's not true. It is true. The great teams and the great players do not matter who they play. It's how they play and how they prepare. And that's the point they're trying to get across. And I'm very glad they said that. You made me just feel good. Front left, Zach. Jimbo, when you enter into a game, do you have a, a pretty good idea of how many run plays to pass options that you want to have, or does the game mm -hmm. dictate that as you go well, along? Game, game plan or dictate. If you got RPOs, you got to be willing if you call RPOs if they're giving them to you. We averaged about 11 yards of play on RPOs in that game and threw the ball really well, really well. Probably well we have as far as RPOs and many opportunities we had in that game all year. I mean, they give us a lot of opportunities, and we took them and we ran it. So we have a runs, what we want to do. Early we tried to establish run. Didn't get the penalties got behind. Then we started taking the RPO and started really got on a roll and, and started taking it. Second half, we had big, we had what, seven plays over 25 yards? Seven plays over 20 yards, those RPOs, runs, and got a good mix and got a good balance going and moved the ball well. So, yeah, I mean, you have an idea going in, but then the game, if, if they change, you got to change. You got to change your game plan based off what they do or how they do it. But we, they didn't really change a lot. I mean, we, we got what we expected. Hmm, 38, we were behind. 
you got behind. You're going to get behind 15 nothing. You're going to have to make some plays. You can't just keep being conservative in what you're doing. We were running it as we were getting behind. So when we got behind, we started, and then we started having success with it. Sometimes if the game plan says it, I've thrown it 50, 60. I've, I mean, you go back in my past. I, listen, we were doing three and 4,000 yard passes before it's popular. Going no huddle. We went no huddle for three years before it's popular back in the 90s. I, I've done all that stuff to do whatever you got to do to win. It's how your team's built, way they are, and what goes on. And my, ideally, you like to have balance. Ideally, with this team, probably in that 24 to 28 range, throwing the football and running it. Keeping good. If you're running the ball with effect, effectiveness and you're throwing it with effectiveness. Down front, right, Travis, and then Cease. Yeah, Coach, uh, in what key ways has Bryce Foster developed through the season? I think overall knowledge of the game. When you're a center, there's, there's a – I don't know how to explain how hard it is, especially when you haven't played a lot of center. First, you got to snap the football. If you ain't never done that, trust me, that's not as easy as it looks. And to do it with a guy right on top of your nose. Second, you're making all the calls. You're, you're the quarterback. Besides the quarterback, you have as much responsibility and knowledge of run calls, where we're blocking, schemes, and that stuff. So I think his knowledge, he's a very intelligent guy. He had, he's a very good athlete, so he adapts to things. He has really good balance, so he adapts to things like snapping the ball and learning athletic movements very easily. And I think he's learned to play with better power. Before, I think he's gotten away with being so big and so strong, they didn't have to play with as much leverage because he was a kid, as I say, manhandle guys in high school. I think he's learned to drop his pad level. And I'm starting to see his athleticism and things he does. He, he has a chance to be a really, really, really good player. And he's a great kid, he, he, and he works at it, and it matters to him. Yeah, I was about to say, is it a guy who, who makes you laugh every now and then too? Yes, he does. He, he, yes, he does. Answer your question. Yes, he does. It's made me think of something. Yes. A little left cease and then Brent down front. I need a smile. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Spillers in a change yardage was pretty even throughout the four-game winning streak. Mm -hmm. But Saturday night, did Ole Miss center more in Spiller or did just no. the offensive line do better when the chain carried? Well, two things. The chain made some really nice runs. Listen, the chain is an extremely talented guy. Extremely. Spiller is too. The chain had some better looks than Spiller did. Not because the line didn't like Spiller, not because they liked the chain better. The, on those particular plays or blocks or whatever went wrong or good and different weren't there as clean for him. I mean, and the chain did some really nice things too. I mean, I'm not taking anything away from his looks. That there was, I mean, the guy's the guy extremely talented. And so you have two guys that are very talented. You're going back and forth, and you're, you're mixing them. And he didn't get as many clean looks. After going back, I said the same thing. Why? It's one of the first times all year. Well, the numbers were very drastically different. And, I, and you got to looking, how, many, how much more could he have done there? Not a lot in certain situations. I mean, it was just, that was the, as I say, he got bad cards sometimes. You know what I'm saying? If you really watch the film. Down front, Brent. And there's always something you could do by yourself. I mean, there, there are bounce, you could bounce out here and make a little better run here and there. Yes, I mean, that, that's, that's all the time. So you mentioned you've gone no huddle in the past when needed. Coach Kiffin said afterward that A&M's methodical approach on offense really helped what he called a shallow defense or no depth on defense. Do you all have the ability to go faster or up-tempo if you Let need me ask to you in this. that situation? Let me ask you this. Uh -oh. <laughs> How many points is no huddle score? How many points is no huddle score in a game? What do you mean? Uh, uh, How many points well, is no offense. huddle offense score in a game? 20. Yes. 20. And him going no huddle helped us because it got us the ball back and kept giving us opportunities instead of eating the clock and keeping it away from us. So, so I guess what I'm asking, do it's you philosophically. Have, yeah, do you have the capability to we, then You can say, go no huddle 100 miles an hour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're not, our, our strength is – our defense is our strength. We're a running football team. We can do things, and we can go no huddle. Do it all you want. That's not what we do. We did last year a bunch. This year at times we didn't. Play, play methodically to how your team is and what you do. And Demas in the end zone, that was an obvious drop. He should have had that one. What was your impression of the, of the interception when he went up for it? Should he you know have had something? that one? Or? Yes, I think he should have, and I think the ball should have been lower. I think he goes right here and still goes through his hands. He's a ball he can catch. Should he put it right here? Yes. Now, here's my question on that, which I – if both guys catch the ball, isn't it an offensive guys? I ain't – both guys got the ball. How is that a pick? Demas came up with it when he hit the ground. Yeah, they both I come mean, up with the ball. They didn't hit. That's it, the other part I'm waiting to find out. It on looked the like interception. An Ole Miss defender to me had it at first. No, he didn't. Just step. No, he didn't. But. It bobbled and they fought into it and run rolled into it. Yeah. And when they called it, his back is on the ground, and the guy from behind him gives him the first down. If you watch it on the on the slope on the replay, they both got it. Both guys got it. Now, should he have caught it? Yes. Should he have thrown it lower? Yes. Okay. But yeah, you got to make plays. There's a ball in the first half right there on the nice. We come off. I should have had that ball on that over. 
It's right there on the tips. I mean, that's those inches I talk about. You're, you're an inch here, you're an inch there. And in games like this, that's where you're at. I mean, and what, you, and what you're fighting for. And we had plenty of opportunities in the game. Last one. Um, Coach Slocum used to tell us that the hardest thing to do in football, and I want to see if you agree with this, is field a punt, catch a punt. Would you agree with that? And, and no. if so, how so? He ain't ever played quarterback. <laughs> so, and, and he ain't ever played quarterback with all the multitude of blitzes coming at you and all the multitude of coverages and all the multi – because you know what you can do back there then? <laughs> and there ain't nothing they can do. When you're standing back there and they, and they come free, you can't go. <laughs> and the block is missed, you can't do that. So playing quarterback – it's a lot tougher than playing. I hope I front. remember that right. Coach might get on me, but it helps to have a guy like Anias with his. Kind of oh no! Is it hard? is it one of the hard things to do? Yes. And there's, I've had tremendous. I've had as phenomenal kickoff return guys that could never and, and not only wouldn't couldn't do punts, won nothing to do with punts. It takes a different kind of cat. The the courage and and the the, the big thing about that is the decision making skills to win the fair catch, when not the fair catch, when to take a chance, how to read the punt, how to, as you say, you're saying watch the punt and catch it. Well, I'm also seeing where's that gunner at? Where's that gunner at? Where's the center at? Which a lot of times people let loose in coverage because he's, he's just a center and he's not one of your better athletes. A guy you'll double team somebody else to elect to leave one guy free for an athlete. Sometimes people do. So you're usually judging from two different sides when a ball's coming, where I, gotta, where I have to return it, where I have to fair catch it, where I have to do whatever with it. Is it one of the hardest things to do? Yes, and it takes and it takes a guy with skill, but it also takes a very tough sun gun because, as you see, I mean, Nice is taking some shots, even when he fair catches, because sometimes they don't see it. I mean, it's a different thing. But I will say the only thing you can do is do that. You can't do that playing quarterback when, when, <laughs> when they're rushing. Sometimes he needs to raise a hand well, it does, but sometimes you want player. You, listen, I'd rather say whoa than giddy up. I want guys – you've got to have a guy back there that has guts – and is willing to take chances. Well, you can go get a guy to catch it. Now, it depends on your philosophy. I've been with coaches too. So I don't even want to return it. I want a fair catch it. And every kick, I just want to make sure we get possession. What is your philosophy on it? You know what I mean? And that goes back. But it is a tough thing to do, yes. And Anias is very, very, very gifted at, at that part of it. And usually quicker guys are better even than faster guys at that position. Faster guys are better on kickoff returns. Quicker guys are better on punt returns. As a generality. Coach, we'll go back behind the lights, Tyler, and then Olin. Coach, uh, on Saturday, your alma mater was leading Florida for, for most of the game. Is I didn't that, know that until afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> is that just kind of proof that you can't take any of these huh. games for granted? And exactly then, right, and it's an example I'm using today. This team's 7-2 and two and play a very good preview. We're talking about all the other previews, a very good team. Listen, their, two, their coaches, offense, defense, court, have been together on two uh, National Championship, Black Historic College Championships at Arkansas Pine Bluff at Southern. They did one at Southern when I was at LSU. They were over their coaches, coordinators then, and coaches, head coaches and stuff. And these guys know how to win. They build a great program. You watch how their coach, their coach very well. They play very well. They're seven and two. Uh, I know they lost last week, but I mean this this is they do a really good job. And you got to play every week. That's remember App State and Michigan. <laughs> remember, I mean, you remember them all. I mean, there, there's listen. You got to play all the time, anywhere. If you get down to anywhere, there's too much talent out there, and especially with the transfer portals. You're getting a lot of guys at this level of football that were really Division One players that either left, I mean, just different reasons, and there's players everywhere. And with that great season that Prairie View is, I mean, what kind of just you know problems could they present? Well, I mean, defensively, they're extremely high blitzing team, uh, high percentage, probably 45 percent overall. Different blitzes, different stunts, very uh, schematically together, and how they do things cause twist games up front. Offensively, three and four wides throwing the football. Transfer quarterback pass was from Columbus, Georgia. I remember him out of high school. Very talented guy out of Louisville. Receivers that can run, uh, can fly, can hit things. Back is very, very talented. Uh, have really good skill guys and throwing the football. I mean, and they can do it. Very good in special teams. I mean, they're, they're a talented team on both sides of the ball. Right side, Olin. A little, a little slot for them as quick as a cat. Well, he, he could play. A couple of things, Jimbo. First of all, um, what has DeMarvin Leal meant to this program since he's been here? First of all, he, he won, a big time guy who was wanted by everybody in the country that says, I want to take a chance on new coaches and things, that, what I want to be a part of and build at A&M and set a culture for the future of what going on. And I think that just his presence of who he was in recruiting was a big part of it. Him, Kenyon, those types of guys that were really, really high guys that a lot of times were leaving the state. You know what I'm saying? That we're keeping here, that we want to play here, I think was huge that way. I think his 
physical skills are very, I mean, extremely gifted. I mean, he's an inside outside guy. He is a very intelligent guy. He is a high character person. He is a really good guy, great personality, magnetic personality. People follow, listen, can articulate what he says, what he wants as a leader very well. A lot of guys can show you, he can show you and, and tell you, and he'll go talk to you and help you. He's a team guy. Uh, I mean, I can't say enough good things about him. He's got a great family, good people. I mean, he's, 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 he's what you want to lay the foundation of your organization. He's one of those, he's those types of guys. Okay. Kenyon's in that group. I mean, there, there's some really, we, we were blessed in that group with some really special guys. Well, then I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, amid of the persistent reports, are you at a point where you can uh, guarantee that you're going to be staying at A&M for next let me, season let me and ask beyond? You this. Here, here's, here's the best. I, I've told everybody I'm staying here, and I've told everybody I plan on being the coach at A&M. All right. And everybody thinks all coaches lie. I know. I know y'all don't believe us, all right? That's why we don't trust y'all, okay? <laughs> so we're even, okay? Whatever we say, nothing's off the record, okay? To you. It's off the record. No, it ain't off the record. You didn't say that, all right? <laughs> but I'm joking. But it, we're going to recruit maybe as good a class. Here's the best. Because I said the other things. I plan on being. I love the AD. I love the president. I love the chancellor. I love living here. I love being in my ranch. I love the family loves it here. I love, I love Kyle Field. I love the people. Which who, I love all that stuff. And that's obviously not good enough. And I get it. I'm not, I'm not mad at you. Oh, I'm sorry, seriously. <laughs> I, I, I read the reports and people come to me. I say, I don't want to hear. I'm not interested. We may, we may recruit number one. We, we're we're going to recruit an unbelievable class this year, okay? So I'm either the dumbest human being on God's earth, okay, who's going to recruit all these guys to A&M so I can go across over here and go play against them, okay? If I, do, if I did that, you ought, to, you ought to say, that's the dumbest human being. I don't want him to be my coach, okay? Guys, we're going to recruit a heck of a class. We're going to have special things here. We're building special things. They're investing in the program. They're investing in everything we got. We're building a culture. We're not where we are. And that, and that was a disappointing thing about Saturday for me, that we didn't take a step in some of the things I thought we really should have. And it wasn't because I want to. It's got to out. And I got to do a better job explaining to our players to get them to do it. But I want to be at AM. I plan on being at AM. I ain't going to know. I don't want to be nowhere else. I love being right here. Is that clean enough? Oh, no, no, not that. you asked your question. Go somebody. All right. we'll and, go. I'm either, and I'm either the dumbest human being in the world to recruit all these guys. And there's other new, there's good news. I mean, we've got a lot of good stuff coming in the future here, okay? <laughs> well, I got, I've counted the one in West Virginia. There you go. Okay. I got my original home farm that I grew up on in West Virginia. I bought a few acres around it to help expand where we have cows, okay? So I, uh, I did that. That, that. That's clarify. I don't have two ranches here. I got one, okay? And I got one in West Virginia, okay? Which was part of an old farm added on to that my mom still lives on. It's a home place my brother is. Does that make sense? Coach, we'll go back behind the lights. Mike? Is that good enough? <laughs> oh, see? I say what? You know what? Don't I, you don't trust me. We're liars, so I don't trust you. How about we're even? We're even. All that? right, Mike. <laughs> Coach, I know you didn't recruit the senior class in, in this current senior class, but what has this group, especially the super seniors, meant to the development? You know, you know here, here's what I'm going to say about seniors that you don't recruit, that buy into what you're doing so much. That sometimes that's even more special. It really is because it's like saying, you know, I know, Coach, you didn't want to bring me in here, and they have to put their trust in. And there's, there's a point when you're a recruit and a new coach comes in, there's a point you're going – do I fit what this guy wants? Does this guy want me? Does he like me? Does he, you know, he never sat in my home. He never promised my mom anything. He never promised anything. And for those guys, to, you know, for them, for them, see, they trusted me, Owen, okay, that what I said to them. They trusted what I said to them, okay, that it was a good thing, all right, that trust me, just do your best or we'll make a spot, believe in what we say, it'll do it. Sometimes that's harder for them to do than it is for anybody else, you know what I'm saying? And for them to buy into what we do, those guys haven't just bought in, they have spread the message. And I appreciate them as much as any, I mean, anything and anybody to be able to say, Coach, I know you didn't recruit me, but I'm going to buy into what you do when you come in here, and I'm going to help spread your message to build a culture of what you want to do. And I have the utmost respect for those guys. And that is a very, 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 very special group of guys to me and what they've done and what they've meant to this program. Front right here, Cole, and then to the left, Battalion. Jimbo, speaking of trust, it feels like the only thing you can trust with SEC officiating right now is the inconsistencies <laughs> of it. Is it frustrating knowing that one week they get a call one way and another week they kind of flip their mind based off the officiating crew? It is, and and, and but I, I, listen, they don't do people don't do it on purpose. I, I don't believe that one hundred percent. And then everybody has a different way to call coach. It's like saying a coach call plays. Is that scenario plays better than that scenario plays? You know what I'm saying? I mean. Everybody has their differences. I mean, there's some things in rules about 
Uh, I wish we, but it's not the rule committee and how they interpret things. I mean, they don't want to make mistakes, but, but it does get frustrating because they understand something. One call can change the outcome of what goes on. I mean, we're talking about, is that an interception? Is that a catch? Is that a hole? I mean, you know, and it's very, there's always the gray area of, it's your opinion to a little, I mean, there's a rule, but that's my opinion, my thought, or you miss it, you know what I mean? Is that a substitute, not a substitute? But I don't, I, I don't believe they're bad people. I don't, I'm going to say bad people. I don't believe they do it on purpose. I don't think they make mistakes. But is it frustrating? Yes. It does get frustrating because the outcomes of games come on. It's emotion. It's life. It's life-changing experiences. You're, and not only for coaches, but for players. I mean, their heart and soul is put into something. I always say this. All right, I'm going to be – I say, coaches, you'll be fine. You get, yes, right. What about the kids? They don't get that moment back. But I don't believe officials do it on purpose. I just – I don't know what the answer is, but it, it's getting tougher and tougher. I don't know if the, I don't know if review has made it worse. And I'm a review, or like, like I think you should review. Like the other day, I had a question on a substitution. They called us real legal guy on the field, but they subbed, didn't see the sub, so they let it go fast. And our guys run off the field. We get a flag for, but they subbed. Well, then they took the flag away for no sub. So obviously. So that, but we didn't get our defense set for the call because they didn't see it. Well, why can't you go back and look at the film and see if there's a sub or not? Set to play again. I mean, why not? if you're going to review it, view it right. Make the game so it's fair. I mean, what we can review, what we can't review, that's the other things I, I, I still have questions about. Interpretations of things, I mean, yeah. I mean, but that's always going to be that way in officiating. And, and listen, officiate, officials, are most of them are ex-players anyway. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and stuff. So, it, But it can be frustrating, no doubt. And then Nick was talking earlier about Seth and what he means to the program, not just as a leader, but also as kind of leading by example off the field. Just oh. what has his impact been to both the program itself and to Texas he's a, A&M? He's University? a better human than he is player. He's, he's a super high Christian young man. And those morals and values, he, he has no problem sharing with other people who want to listen and be part of it and Bible studies and things of that nature and talk to him and be with him. And, I mean, he's what a teammate is. He's what a good person is. He's what people ought to be. It's what all people ought to be, in my opinion. I, I, I have the utmost respect for, for Seth as who he is, what he does, and how he does it tremendously. Go to the left, third row, battalion, think back to back, and then Justin, you'll wrap us up. In pregame warm-ups, we saw Calzada wearing a Haynes King shirt. How have you seen this team's brotherhood progress throughout the course of the season? They are that now. They are my brother's keeper. I mean, they, they, they – when one gets hurt, the other's trying to root for the other, trying to help. I mean, Haynes is in there film, study, coming off the film. He'll ask. I mean, they have no – there's no animosity. I mean, I've seen you – know, I've seen teams where guys don't talk, they go the other end, and I guess I, whatever, but that's not there. And these guys do it. I mean, watching Spiller and uh, a chain. you got two great backs who get that. That one's happy for the other one. He's running as he is for the other guy. I mean, I mean the deep. I mean, it's the D linemen. All those D linemen, those D ends, and when Tyree's been, and you got Leal, you got Johnson. I mean, Michael Clemens and all those guys, and, Ty, and all of a sudden, but Tyree's been Player of the Week what two or three times. They're as happy for him as they are for him. I mean, they, there is no, there's a, there is a true bond and team here, as far as the camaraderie and how they care for each other. And and I can tell them this is probably the last time in their life there's ever going to. There's nothing like being on a team. Don't ever waste that. Don't ever waste that. I mean, and the higher levels of ball you go, the worse it gets. And I don't mean that in – it's just it becomes a job and the individualism. they got families, they got different things now. That camaraderie in high school, that camaraderie in college, I don't think – I mean, even there's nothing like it, man. And I think they're enjoying it. I hope they are. Stay at third appreciating it. Go ahead, Jennifer. Hi, Coach Fisher. Jennifer Shooter yeah. with the Battalion. Um, you know, with this being the last home game of the season, what do you hope this game means to those super seniors who chose to utilize their extra year of eligibility? I hope – no, no, they'll, they'll appreciate the game. And I, I hope – I know I always hate guys being sad. I, I try it's, it's, I mean, you know, your last games, I've seen guys, it, it's really affected emotionally. But what I hope they reflect on is that they made the right decision, that they feel really comfortable about the environment and atmosphere and the program in which they came into – the school in which they come into and the family they come into, not only in the football program, but into the Aggie Network, the 12th man, and what A&M represents. And, what they have, and I hope they appreciate what they have meant to, and it's hard to understand it yourself, what you've really meant to this school and what you've done for this school, and that you are really comfortable and happy that I know I made the right choice three or four or five years, you know, I guess four or five years ago, whatever it was. I guess six years ago on some of these guys, huh? <laughs> I mean, now that that. But, I mean, I, I, that's, that's what I hope they, they can really relish and, and reflect on. Coach, we'll 
Finish up with Justin yes, on the left. Coach, I know the timing is a little different. Down two against Mississippi State, you had to go the length of field only two and a half minutes. And last Saturday, you were down two is about seven minutes. So I get the time differences there. Down but two with. Down two. Just I'm talking about how much you practice those situations and how shocked you are they didn't carry over to the game when you needed a touchdown or a field goal to go oh, take down the with lead. Oh, down with 15-10. Yeah, I mean, we just missed a block and dropped the ball. Yep, go ahead. I mean, is that something you practice? Like, hey, we need we need to go down the field here. We, yeah, we do. We got uh, we do we do. You got two timeouts, one timeout, no timeouts. Uh, you need a field goal. You need a touchdown. We practice last plays of the game from the ten in. Clock's running from the fifteen out, from the twenty five out. You have a set of plays from the four in. Uh, things you know, clock's running, no running. We got two plays. We got one. I mean, it's constantly. Matter of fact, went into a scenario in two minutes the other day before we was on the road. It was a four play set from the three yard line. I made. We had scored on a two minute drive. I stopped it, put it back on a three, and I said, "There's 18 seconds, no timeouts. We had four, we got three or four plays off, and one for not just us on offense, but defense. How you make calls, how you, how you come, you know, how you get set, how do you play those no huddle situations? I mean, all the time. I mean, it's it's a, I say situational football. You know, you're at the plus 45, you got no timeouts, need a field goal. You're at the minute 30, 70 yards to go, need to, need a touchdown, or you need two scores like there at the other one. If we, I was hoping." Like we could hit a chunk pass, even though we were down at the end. It was 10. It was a minute and two. We got it. We hit the nine. I was hoping to get back to it. If we could hit one right there to the 50 and maybe hit another one to the 25, like, and I got another chunk, I was probably going to kick a field goal 30 seconds to go to kick it and then try to go to the onside instead of waste all that time, try to get an onside, at least have a shot for the end zone. I mean, you have different scenarios like that. Do you, when you have two scores, when do you kick a field goal, when you don't kick a field goal? You know what I mean? Because you can keep trying to get the, field, the touchdown, but you eat all the clock up. Where, you know, if you can hit a 30 or 40 yard field goal, then try to onside because you got to get it back anyway. At least have a shot for the end zone, not eating the clock. I mean, those that was something that was in the thought process. I had Eric ready. If we if we hit a big play and get to the 25 or 30 or whatever, and we're in a comfortable, really consistent range where we kick field goal and it's 30, 40 seconds ago, I'm gonna kick the field goal. Then we'll kick the onside. Then we'll see if we you know, then you get 30 seconds, five, maybe you get a shot for the end zone or whatever. I mean, but those things are you can't do them enough. Because I'm gonna tell you this, and I found this out about two minutes. I'm as big a two-minute guy for the half, end of the game as anybody as far as practicing it. And how many times I do it, I'm going to say six or seven out of not ten times you do it, something happens that ain't never happened before. And that's over 30 years. I mean, just different. <laughs> you, can't, you couldn't think something else could happen, but it would. And how it just, it's just quirky. So many times you can put yourself in that position and get the kids at least comfortable with what you're trying to do. You can write all that answer, see. All right. Yeah. All right. Coach I mean, a them? bunch. I mean, you try. We, 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 we do practice a lot of those situations, a lot. Thanks for your time, Coach. Thank you guys very much.